Hello everyone, for those who don't know me, I'm Just Willie, series creator of Did I Get What I Paid For? However, on this episode, I served only as writer, producer, co-editor, and actor. This isn't really a director's commentary because this episode was so technically complicated that I handed off directing to my collaborator, Matthew Ship. But first, I want to talk about this scene. If you couldn't tell by the way I look in the opening teaser and the second end tag and the main body of the episode, they were shot much later. We started work on Jack and the Beanstalk in August or September of 2020, hence the PPE when we were shooting outside. We originally teased Jack and the Beanstalk as an episode at the end of the June 2020 episode of Did I Get What I Paid For when I reviewed Gulliver's Travels. This was going to lead into sort of our summer trilogy of Gulliver's Travels, the Captain America TV movie from the 70s, and Jack and the Beanstalk. And then I wrote the script, which Matt said was great, and yeah, we're going to have to cut a few bits to make it something we could actually shoot, but it could be done. It was so complicated, in fact, that we took some time off. I did a few more low-key videos so that we could spend time to get this just right. This took about three weeks, which for us is a lot of time. Usually, I have a nebulous list of movies I want to do for a year. I'll pick one, watch it, write a script, shoot it, and edit it in about two and a half weeks. Here we spent a week refining the script, a week of pre-production, and three and a half days shooting. And then editing took a long time. I needed to do an episode to keep you guys interested and keep my channel relevant to the YouTube algorithm. Originally my idea was to follow up Jack and the Beanstalk with the Garbage Pail Kids movie, but a lot of the sketch sequences I wanted to do wouldn't work without having seen Jack and the Beanstalk. So I did a quick time jump gimmick and did Star Trek the Motion Picture instead. There were a few gags we had to cut out of Plan 9 from Outer Space as well, because originally Matt thought he could finish Jack and the Beanstalk while I was doing those other two episodes. He couldn't. So... I, alas, did not get attacked by zombies in Plan 9. Eventually, he took so long that the episode basically became lost media. So when we finally got to make it, I wanted to make fun of that. I went back to that missing time bit of the lore from the Star Trek episode and use it to make fun of myself by showing part of an episode that doesn't actually exist. My original plan was to do the movie Angels with Filthy Souls, because to this day, a lot of people don't know that that isn't a real movie. It was a fake one shot for Home Alone. But instead, I wound up doing a real piece of lost media. Jerry Lewis's The Day the Clown Cried, which is a real movie. Jerry Lewis made a comedy about the Holocaust, and it was never released for rather obvious reasons. Now, when we get to the actual episode, you see why editing was sort of a nightmare. From the moment we see the beanstalk up to the point where we get back down, there isn't a single shot that doesn't have at least one green screen element. And that's why Matt had to be the editor. I can do green screening. I sort of got the handle on it when we did Plan 9 in Outer Space, Francis the Talking Mule, and the Muppet movie. Matt did most of the green screen work on Holiday Hell because of the complexity. You know, me handing an object to myself. As for the reason Matt directed, when you're working with green screen, 
and it's just a background, that's easy to do. But when you're talking to another character, especially one who isn't actually there, it can be difficult in terms of acting. And I'm not that great at that to begin with. Now, when you have the scene at the beginning with me talking to Ralph, you had me in the front yard recording my lines. Matt would do what Sam Raimi calls shemping. He read Ralph's lines so I would have something to react to. Then later, I'd watch my performances on playback. We'd decide which ones we were going to use, and I would gauge my performance as Ralph accordingly. It's relatively easy. The same thing cannot be said for the scenes with Hakate, if it weren't for the fact that we didn't get the recordings back from Marche for about a week or two, and I didn't want to get another haircut, I would have redubbed my performance a little bit. I mean, it's still good, but I think if I knew what Marche was going to bring to the character, I would have gone a little bit more out of the way to make the Jess character a little more of a... As for casting Marche, well, she had done the Priceline video for me, and she was great. Funny in that Margaret Dumont in a Marx Brothers movie sort of way. I knew she could do more than that. So I looked at the way the housekeeper and harp character are usually portrayed in tellings of Jack and the Beanstalk. And did the opposite of that. Now, I originally cast Marche out of necessity. I was already doing three characters. Matt was doing two. We even brought in our friend Danny, so we needed all hands on deck. But when I saw the harmonica we found at Dollar Tree, I saw the eyeball stickers we got at Michael's, I saw how they looked together, and I looked at the script as written, and I made a few tweaks to make her a bit more sassy. After that, all the elements, the prop, the script, Marche, just sort of clicked. It's what a lot of filmmakers call cinematic alchemy, with the end result being greater than the sum of the parts. The reason for Hakate being a still shot at the door were because my hand was wobbly, and... She looks a tad weird because Matt and I had different ideas about how to make her fly in the shot. And in the initial version, you could see my hand. I'm not sure how he fixed it. I thought about three ways. I'm pretty sure the way I wanted to do it was possible, but it would have taken a lot more time. I'm pretty sure Matt just adjusted the zoom here, so you don't quite see my hand. Whereas, I would have gotten one shot of the door without Hakate there, another with her there. Since my hand was the only thing that color in the shot that wouldn't be in both shots, use chroma key to remove my hand. Then export the film to an MP4 then use that MP4 as the new green screen shot. That would take a long time, but it's how I did one of the effects in the Plan 9 review. But I don't think he did that here. Okay, this bit here is another point of contention. Also, Spray Zarathustra is a song that was written in 1895. It is, in and of itself, in the public domain. You can find dozens of royalty-free versions arranged a little differently from the one used in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Some even close enough to invoke the joke we were going for without being the 2001 version. And, you know, 
getting the YouTube algorithm after me. Lucky me, Rhino would rather place ads on the video and get the money that way than shutting my channel down. And Matt was directing, so it was his call. If my channel was monetized, yeah, I think I would have fought more. As it is, Rhino Records will probably see more money from my channel than I ever will. My other problem was the recordings I made of me drinking a can of Barks and belching didn't come out right. We had to use stock audio sound effects because no matter how hard I tried and how many cans I drank, I couldn't belch like that on demand anyway. The funny thing is, 10 minutes later, Matt and I were watching an episode of a Star Trek, and I managed to burp out the words, Space, the final frontier, these are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. But that's just luck for you. Now let's talk about the duck scene. I was talking about the video with Matt and Danny on our way to Bad Movie Club. Danny wanted to be in this one since it had been a long time since he'd made a guest appearance. I mentioned that I would need a goose that laid the golden eggs character. Matt said finding a toy goose would be impossible. Golden eggs would be even harder. And I replied with something stupid. We'll just get a toy duck and a yellow egg of silly putty from Dollar Tree. Even Danny thought that was kind of stupid. So I pitched the scene, pretty much as it appears in the script, in the car, and they were laughing their asses off. We didn't let Danny see the duck. Originally, this was a prank on Matt's part, but in the end, I was afraid that letting him see the duck would taint his performance. We had let Marche see Hakate, because I knew she could handle that. I've had Ralph since I was... Well, I don't know how old I was when I got him. But seeing him and using him, I just sort of figured I would do my Wallace Shawn impression. I don't know why, I just did. But with Danny, it was a little bit different. Matt at the Giant. 90% of the performance comes from him using his audio equipment and some visual effects. He adjusted his speed, modulation, pretty much everything. Then he played with the scale for those few shots where he and I were supposed to be on screen at the same time, so that I either looked very small or he was very big. Which is pretty easy to do when you're messing with a green screen. The banana scene, probably the hardest effect to do. We still didn't get it quite right. We had several takes of the banana peeling, but we just couldn't get it to sink right. Now, look closely at this chase scene. Look very closely. You'll notice that I am not wearing my mask when I'm at the top of the clouds. Now, Look at me as I hit the ground. It's back on. Though the beanstalk is pretty big, so I guess even if I was falling at a rate of 30 feet per second squared, I might have had time to take it out of my pocket and put it back on on the way down. We shot the scene to the top of the beanstalk and the, at the bottom on two different days. I think the stuff at the bottom was two days before the stuff at the top. Anyway, I just took a jump while Matt was running the camera, but we cut out the scene where I started the jump. And on a few of the takes, I actually hit my tailbone. So if it looks like I'm sort of confused, used and in pain. That might not be acting. That might actually be me in pain. There's also a line we forgot to record. We just lucked out that we were planning to fade to black on the chainsaw anyway. 
So when we realized we didn't record it in spite of improving it in a few dry runs, we were able to sneak in that Hail the King Baby, which is of course a reference to the Evil Dead movies, which have their own, um, disturbing history with magical plants. And now on to the Taco Bell gag. As you might know, Matt and I eat there a lot. Mostly because it's cheap as hell. This was originally shot around the time they had the triple lupa, which was really just a double chalupa, only it had three folds and different meats. So we thought, given how crazy some actual Taco Bell items are, this didn't seem too absurd. But neither Matt or I have the macho type of voice you need for that kind of ad. So before I tried doing a half-assed version myself, I messaged my old buddy Nick Robeson, who was a professional martial arts instructor who totally does. I showed him the script and asked if he'd be willing to do it, and he said yes. Not only that, he really enjoyed himself, and said if I ever needed him to voice another character again, just ask. And, well, anyone who's watching the series now knows how that turned out. We didn't even go with the version where he was 100% on script. What I've learned in every video we've done since, when writing for Nick, you give him the scene. You write the sane or not quite insane version of the scene. You let him do a few shit takes where he's just riffing. Every once in a while you're gonna wanna use, and probably should use, one of the shit takes. Because it's so damn funny. And in one case, I even had him redo the shit takes. Because it was a case where we had gone on Zoom so we could basically shemp my lines in so we'd know how to react. And it was just so funny that I couldn't stop myself from laughing during the record. As for the first little cutscene, this is the one that makes the whole video not for kids. You can invert the audio on the F-bombs. You can cut a few of the numerous cannibalism jokes. But you can't keep a joke about a horse fucking a pig and keep the video rated as okay for viewing by those under the age of 16. Sorry about that. But there was a little secret about this scene which I have already alluded to. I did not one, not two, but three characters in this episode. I obviously play myself. I mean, we thought about hiring Grant Gustin to play me, but he was way too expensive. I'm also the voice of Ralph. What you don't see on the credits, probably because Matt forgot, was that I'm the voice of Henwen. The second cutscene just finishes up the review of Day the Clown Cried. As noted, this is a real movie. It actually exists. Film scholars call it the holy grail of lost media. The Smithsonian and Library of Congress actually have a copy. Yes, it is being remastered. That part is true. But nobody, and I mean nobody outside of the restoration team, is legally allowed to see it until the year 2024. That's really all I have to say. Hope to see you soon. There'll be another actual episode of Did I Get What I Paid For very soon. If you like this episode, please hit like and subscribe. Or go to patreon.com slash parodyerafilms and become a patron.